Hi, my name is Luo Daohai. I'm an associate professor of infection immunity at Lee Kuan Chen School of Medicine. In this lecture, I will give you an introduction on SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that caused currently ongoing pandemic COVID-19. Here is the outline. I will first introduce the coronavirus with a particular emphasis on the phylogenetic relationship between SARS-CoV-2 and other coronavirus that cause human diseases. We will then take a closer look at the virus and its life cycle, followed by a brief update on the antiviral drug development. I will leave you with some references and resources for further study and research. In late December 2019, patients presenting with pneumonia due to an identified microbial agent were reported in Wuhan, China. A novel coronavirus was subsequently identified as the causative pathogen. Researchers in China quickly sequenced the virus genome and performed phylogenetic analysis to determine the evolutionary history of the virus. Within the coronavirus family, this novel virus was placed in the beta coronavirus genus. Notably, its genome is closely related to two bat-derived SARS-like coronaviruses with sequence identity about 88%, but were more distant from SARS coronavirus with about 79% sequence identity and further distant from MERS coronavirus with about 50% sequence identity. It's further distant from the coronavirus that caused common cold in human, as been highlighted at the bottom of the slide. In red, this coronavirus is now renamed as SARS-CoV-2 because of the sequence close relationship with the SARS and the disease that it caused. Now let's have a look at the virus particle itself. Upper left is the first TEM image of the SARS-CoV-2 virus particle isolated and subcultured from a COVID-19 patient. Lower left is a pseudo-colored SEM microscopic image of SARS-CoV-2 virus particle grown in the cell. It looks like they are being released from the infected cells. On the right, it is a structure model of coronavirus particle the coronaviruses in general are enveloped, round, but pleomorphic. The particles are about 100 to 120 nanometer in diameter. On the surface of the virus particle, there are spike proteins, which form trimer-like crown. This is how the coronavirus was initially named. The S protein is very important because it binds to the cell surface receptor and mediates the virus entry into the cells. It is also the most important virus antigen as the target for antibodies. Both membrane proteins and E envelope proteins are embedded in the lipid bilayer. They are important for viral assembly and integrity. The RNA genome is associated with N protein to form the nuclear capsid in the interior of the virus particle. Here is a cartoon diagram of the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. The first step is entry. Attachment of the virus S protein to the receptor mediates the endocytosis of the virus into the host cell. The cellular receptor has been identified as angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. Within the endosome, the virus membrane will fuse with the endosome membrane and the positive sense RNA genome is released into the cytoplasma. The genomic RNA of the virus has 5 prime end cap and 3 prime end poly A tail. Therefore, it can serve as the mRNA for immediate translation. The product is replicates polyproteins, which is then digested by the viral protease to release the individual proteins. The virus replication of the RNA and the transcription then occurs. More copies of genomic and subgenomic RNAs are then generated. Structural proteins S, M, E, and N are produced from these subgenomic mRNAs, and then virus nucleocapsids 
These structural proteins are assembled from the genomic RNA and N protein, followed by budding of the viron at the membrane, derived from the ER and Golgi apparatus. Virons are then released from the cell through exocytosis. To have a better understanding about the virus, in the following slides, we will take a closer look at a few essential steps during this cycle, namely entry, RNA replication, and transcription. The S protein is responsible for virus entry into cells. It is a key target for vaccine, therapeutics, and diagnostic development. On the left, this figure shows the structure of SARS-CoV-2 S trimer in the pre-fusion conformation as they are on the virus surface. The S protein is very large and has multiple domains. To highlight, the N terminal half, also called S1 subunit, containing the receptor binding domains, which is very flexible. Only when it's in this upper conformation, it is able to interact with the receptor. And the C terminal half of S, S2 subunit, is responsible for membrane fusion. The middle panel displays the overall structure of S RBD domain in orange, binding to the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptor is a dimeric membrane protein which can bind two molecules of S. On the right, we compare the interface between SARS-CoV-2 RBD and the SARS-CoV RBD with ACE2 at the bottom. They have very similar binding patterns. However, it was found that SARS-CoV-2 has higher affinity for ACE2 than SARS-CoV. This may contribute to ease of human-human transmission. This slide summarizes the process of membrane fusion between the virus and the endosome after endocytosis. Within this endosome, the S protein is cleaved by the endosomal protease into loosely bound S1, S2 subunit dimers. The binding of ACE2 then fuse further to stabilize the S1 and S2 and induce the conformational changes from pre to post fusion state of S2 subunit. The S2 subunit then reach to the host cell endosome membrane and brings the two membranes close together by un undergoing large conformational changes. This will initiate the membrane fusion. After that, the virus genome is released into the cytoplasmic environment to start the replication and transcription. The coronavirus has the largest genome among the positive sense RNA viruses. SARS-CoV-2 genome is 30 kilobases. In comparison, we know the dengue genome has only 11 kb. The SARS-CoV-2 genome has 5-permain cap and 3-permain poly tail and serve as the mRNA for translation. Therefore, the genome becomes the first mRNA that can encode for open reading frame 1a and 1b. The result polyprotein is called 1A or polyprotein 1AB. This polyprotein is then further processed by two viral proteases, pepin-like proteinase and the 3C-like protease, into up to 16 individual non-structural proteins, which are mostly involved in RNA replication and transcription by assemble with RNA into the replicase complex. Structural protein S, E, M, and N, and a few other small proteins with unknown functions are then expressed from the subgenomic mRNA. There are also mechanisms to further increase the genome's coding capacity. For example, ribosome frame shift, leaky scan, these events happen during the translation process. Both genome replication and subgenomic mRNA transcription are carried out by the replicase proteins. This protein uses the genome as the template to generate full-length negative sense RNA, which subsequently serves as template in generating additional full-length genome. 
coronavirus mRNAs are all containing a common 5' leader sequence fused to downstream gene sequences. These leader sequences are added by discontinuous synthesis of negative sense subgenomic RNA using genomic RNA as the template. Subgenomic RNA are initiated at the 3' end of the genome and proceed until they encounter one of the transcriptional regulatory sequence, TRS sequence, highlighted in red, that recede upstream of most open reading frames. Through base pairing interactions, the nascent transcript is then transferred to the complementary leader TRS sequence, and transcription continues through the 5' end of the genome. These subgenomic RNAs can then serve as a template for viral mRNA production. After that, all negative sense RNAs will be degraded. The actual mechanism of RNA synthesis is not entirely clear. On the left is the latest model showing the SARS coronavirus induced network of modified intracellular membrane structures with which both virus replicate subunits and double-stranded RNA can be found associating to each other. These convoluted membrane structures play important roles. They serve to concentrate viral proteins to microenvironment, where all necessary replication factors are closely associated with the genomic RNA. They could also exclude host factors, so that competition for resources like nucleotides can be focused on the virus. They can also act to separate double-stranded RNA intermediates during the replication process from the host innate immune receptors, such as reg -I and MD5, so that the virus can avoid activating host innate immune response during the replication process. On the right, it is a working model of how the non-structural proteins and the viral RNA forming the core of the replication complex. Notably, the non-structural proteins 7 and 8 could form assembly on the virus double-stranded RNA and may serve as a primase to generate a primer for the replicase to start. NSP12, non-structural protein 12, is the virus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It is also an important target for antiviral drug development. The NSP14 is an interesting protein. It is RNA endonuclease, which may enhance the replication fidelity by proofreading mechanism. Altogether, these non-structural proteins work efficiently in synthesizing viral genomic and subgenomic RNA. COVID-19 has spread widely across the world. The pandemic disease has claimed thousands of lives worldwide in less than four months. We are not seeing an end to it yet. Unfortunately, no drug or vaccine has yet been approved to treat COVID-19. Patients can only receive supportive care and counting on their own immune defense mechanism to fight against the virus. We are in desperate need for antivirals. The rationale for antiviral development is very simple. So it's to inhibit key components of coronavirus infection life cycle, or to manage or reduce the symptoms and the pathogenic effects. As for the drug target, they can be host factors or viral components. Unfortunately, the novel drug discovery are likely to take months to years time and is full of uncertainty. Currently, there are over hundreds of active clinical trials that's been conducted worldwide to find drugs to cure COVID-19. All of these clinical trials rely on repurposing the existing drugs. Some candidates are listed here. For example, interferon and hydrochloroquine are the host immune modulators. Covalescent serum may contain neutralizing antibody and antiviral immune modulators as well. 
Remdesivir was developed for Ebola virus outbreak, which turned out to be effective as good antiviral candidate against coronavirus. Its mechanism is through inhibiting the virus polymerase. Favipiravir is another approved influenza drug. It is also a viral polymerase inhibitor, similar to that of remdesivir. So let's hope that we will have some effective antivirals to treat COVID-19. Regardless, there will be a vaccine available anytime soon. This slide just contains some references for those who are interested in further studying this topic. With this, I will end this short introductory lecture. Thank you for your attention.